hope everyone's doing well today. Um, as you can see, today for the first time we have a live audience for our tiny ML talk, which is, is very exciting. So um, before, uh, or without further ado, let's get going. So today we have a, a really cool talk. It's on train by weight, accelerated deep learning by data dimensionality reduction. And that's by Michael Zhou and Jing Hang Lin from Rose Holman Institute of Technology. So as usual, I'd like to thank all of our TinyML Talk sponsors. Um, we have Arm and Qualcomm, who are both our TinyML strategic partners. And then we have DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Reality AI, and Syncense. And if you're interested in sponsoring TinyML Talks, we're always excited to hear from you. So please reach out to olga at tinyml.org. Um, and that will come up later in the talk as well, if you, if you need that email address. Um, so my name is Daniel Sitanayaka. I'm uh, the lead of TinyML R&D at Edge Impulse. So we also wanted to um, discuss our TinyML Foundation collaboration with Hackster.io on this TinyML Vision Challenge. So this is a challenge open now where you can submit things that you've created, um, new use cases or applications for TinyML Vision. And submissions are being accepted until August 15th, 2021. Uh, so there's $6,000 worth of prizes available. And um, you can also sponsor this contest if you're interested. So just reach out to sponsorships at tinyml.org. But you can head to that Hackster URL at the bottom if you're interested, really exciting stuff. Um, and I also wanted to talk about our successful TinyML 2021 Summit. Um, we have five days of tutorials, talks, panels, breakouts. There's a the research symposium, um, really awesome talks. You can head to the um, TinyML YouTube channel and see more than 150 videos with talks and workshops and sessions from the summit. Uh, so we, ha we had over 5,000 registered attendees from over 100 countries. So that's very exciting. So I'd uh, really recommend heading to YouTube and you can see these TinyML Summit talks as well as all of our TinyML Talks content that we've um, released in the past. We also have the TinyML EMEA Technical Forum coming up from June 7 to 10th. So the deadline for abstracts is May the 1st. So um, you got a, a few more days to submit abstracts. But um, yeah, that's going to be that's going to be online, virtual, but live. So you should head, head over to our tinyml.org for more information. And we can also uh, we're also accepting sponsorships here. So sponsorships at tinyml.org is the place to go. Our next talk is going to be on Tuesday, May 11th, and that's going to be by Chris Narosky, who's CTO of SenseML. And the topic is building an edge optimized tiny ML application for the Arduino Nano 33 BLE sense. If you're interested in submitting a talk um, to the tiny ML talk series, just drop us an email at talks at tinyml.org with some information. And as some reminders, the slides and the video will be available tomorrow from our tinyml.org and on YouTube. And if you have questions, please um, use this Q&A feature that's part of Slack. So, uh, sorry, part of uh, Zoom. So you just click the button at the bottom, a little window will pop up and you can put your questions in there. Please don't use the chat window for questions because that just gets lost in the, in the conversation. So try and use the Q&A tool and we'll be taking questions at the end. So first I want to introduce Michael Joe. So Michael Joe received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering in 2018 from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is currently an assistant professor at Rose Holman Institute of Technology in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. His current research interests are accelerated embedded machine learning, computer vision, and integration of artificial intelligence and nanotechnology. Jing Heng Lin was born in Zhengzi Province, China in 2000. He's currently pursuing a BS degree in computer engineering at Rose Holman Institute of Technology. His primary research interests are principal component analysis based machine learning and deep learning acceleration. 
Besides his primary research project, Zheng Heng is currently working on pattern recognition of rapid saliva COVID-19 test response, which is a collaboration with 12 to 15 molecular diagnostics. So this is looking like a super interesting talk. Um, I'm very excited to, to see it. So I'll let you guys take the uh, reins. Thanks for the kind introduction and opportunity to present our work, TBW, Train by Weight, which is an algorithmic approach using the data dimensionality reduction and using the classifier to accelerate the deep learning framework. Again, I'm Lin, a third year senior in the Electrical Computer Engineering Department at Rose Holman Institute of Technology, supervised by Dr. Michael Joe and our assistant professor in our department. Today, I'm more than happy to present our exciting work. So I will present our work as follows. First, I will briefly walk you through the related technical training and challenge that motivate our research project. Then I will discuss about the dimensionality reduction by linear classifiers such as principal component analysis or non-negative matrix factorization. In our work, we will primarily talk about the PCA, which is the primary uh, principal component analysis. Then I will talk about our proposed idea, which is an algorithmic approach of combining linear classifier and non-linear classifier. In turn, I will show an experiment result on two different applications. At the end, I will discuss uh, some of the remaining challenge and the future work and conclude my talk. So first, let me talk about the current market and the challenge that motivate our work. So back in the late 20th century, the United States Post Office tried to find a way to recognize the handwritten digit in every envelope, trying to accelerate the sorting process and to reduce the cost by human labor. And that is actually a very successful project and those handwritten digits can be successfully recognized by the machine. At that time, the input image was just a 24 by 24 pixel image. However, as the image resolution has continuously increased with the so-called image revolution, we were able to obtain the image with larger pixels. For example, one of the most popular deep learning module like nowadays took a 224 by 224 pixel image but the practical images are in higher definition, such as 1K, 2K, even 4K images. Think about doubling your image size in each dimension. You are essentially quadrupling your image pixel. As can be seen, for 4K images, you have a 3840 by 216 pixel image, which consists of about 8.2 million pixels. That is like, 1,400 times larger amount pixel compared to the handwritten digital image. So the development of image resolution caused high demands on pre-processing technique. If we want to perform image recognition with such high resolution image. So a very common architecture for image recognition or image classification is called artificial neural network. And the idea behind the artificial neural network is actually our human brain. When we human try to learn new knowledge or recognize a new object, we are actually building connection between the different neurons of our brain. So the more we repeat on the learning process, the stronger connection between the neuron will be. And the, in the same times, the more mistake we make, we also learn from the mistake. And the similar idea applies here. The, the artificial neural network try to replicate the process of human brain learning. So there are three types of layer, which are input layer, hidden layers, and output layer. And the training process works as follows. We will first reshape or vectorize the object image into a single column and we feed them to the input layer. And that will go through multiple hidden layers that have multiple nodes as described as circle in the graph. And these nodes have weight inside. And after going through multiple hidden layer, the output layer will have the predict result. For example, the predict result may be an apple, raspberry, or mango, depending on the input image. And a very important process for artificial neural network is called backpropagation. 
which means we, we compare the output with the true output in the label. For example, although the true result is an apple, so our module will give us a result mongo, then we, we need to um, give a punishment to the hidden layer by, by back propagating, say, oh, you need to correct the parameter. So going back and forth, we are trying to get the most accuracy parameter for the node of the hidden layer. So the next time when we um, feed the input of a Mongo image to the artificial neural network, it is supposed to give us the correct output, which is Mongo. However, the artificial neural network is only suitable for the small input because as the image resolution increase, artificial neural network becomes more complex. And that is why we have a convolutional neural network, which take advantage of convolution. Many may think of the convolution as a technique in communication or signal processing. However, here convolutional means you have multiple kernels that went through the image input and produce multiple convolutional layers. And that process take advantage of the convolution that can extract the feature and the information from the input image. And there are also other layers such as uh, pooling layers or fully connected layers. The function of pooling layer is just truncate the size of the, um, the image. And the fully connected layer is responsible for producing the, the predict output. And these layers can go very deep, as you can see on the right. This is a actually very famous convolutional neural network module called GoogleNet, which is actually created by the company Google. It has 22 layers deep. And because of the layers are deep, it actually took a long time for the training process. And here you can see the table showing the state of our deep learning module and the training data demand. You can see for the VGG net on the left, it actually require 140 million parameter. And if you want to fully train um, each category, you will need to provide 1.2 million image for each category. And imagine that we have millions of image in high resolution, such as 4K image, can see some millions of pixels you will have trillions of image pixels going through the network. Of course, we can reduce the image into a reasonable size, but that will still require billions of image pixels. So as you can see on the right, as the category increase from 10 to 100, the amount of time you need the training also increase significantly. So we are tempted to think, is there a way that we can reduce the training time and nowadays, those pre-trained deep learning module are available for easy employment. You can see on the, the, the animation. And the, however, user may still need to retrain their class or category depending on the application. You can see on the, uh, the machine learning can um, produce a very good result for the dog and the cat category. However, in base, we user may need some special case or outliers also be recognized by the machine. Um, however, our module is struggling to find to classify those outliers or special cases. That's why uh, we may need to retrain the module. Also, sometimes your application may face a new class or category, and you will need to train for the new class. Unfortunately, you will need to provide another millions of image, and we need to spend another day for training. And this technique is actually called transfer learning, where we basically use the existing module to train a new class or category to fit our purpose. So as in the previous slide, we need training data if we need to retrain or need to train a class. The thing is, if one is using a server or if one has enough computational power, this is not a big deal. And the process can take less time as the more computational power provided. However, another reason why we are pondering about this data reduction is because there's a demand in Internet of Things and the cyber physical systems. Just to rephrase or define what it means by Internet of Things or cyber physical system is that you want to have remote access 
to every single electronic device, not, not even electronic device, anything that can be accountable, which means that they're all connected through network. Right now, many products are already aware about having this possible application. So even portable storage or portable disk drive now having Wi-Fi internet access. So you can actually connect through wireless communication. But many of the former products have bottleneck when it comes to the internet of things. Old car or old refrigerator, or even our house are old fashioned. So you need a small assistant that can monitor or understand the current status of your classic report. In addition to understanding the status of old product using sensor, you need also be able to update or actually respond to that system. Therefore, you will need a small development kit or embedded system that are connected to old fashioned device. Example of Internet of Things are small TV, smart um, temperature sensor, and the demand on this smart uh, application or artificial intelligent chip device increased significantly. As you can see on the chart on the left, currently the, the market is worth 2.6 billion US dollars but it is predicted to grow very fast and reach $40.2 billion in five years. So if you look at table on the left, showing the current smart development kits, like even they are equipped with very powerful processor. The speed is still around 1.5 gigahertz due to the limited power supply. Also look at the GPU. You have very limited GPU resources. In addition, the RAM is very limited. It's about two to four gigabytes compared with the server or cloud system. Still, the development kit will rely on Moore's law or other physical development to actually integrate large computation unit or large memory. So based on the current technical trend in the market, we want to find a smarter way to accelerate the time consuming module training and to support our tiny ML community. At the same time, by reduce the data size, we want to minimize the challenge from limited computation power. Now, let me walk you through the process of dimensionality reduction by linear classifiers. Dimensionality reduction will be performed by a linear classifier called Principal Component Analysis, PCA. As you can see, a group of data points in three dimensional space on the left, you can think of it as a sculpture. And the way how PCA works is similar to photography. You are going to take picture of the three dimensional sculpture in certain angle. And the picture you took will visualize slightly different as you change the angle. And you also represent different model information. So on the right side is a picture I took from a certain angle. And the X axis, you can think of it as a first um, principal component and the y-axis as the second principal component. So what the PCA did is actually project the data from higher dimension to the lower dimension, and but it still keep the most of essential information. And the advantage of PCA is the reduced input data size for different training, and we still keep the most essential information captured by selecting the component that matter the most. On the right, we have a data points in X, Y axis, and the first principal component are used to define our data point. And you can see this data vary more by the first principal component dimension compared with the second one. We can basically use the first dimension to reduce the data size. And we will use the first dimension to represent the data that was originally um, represented by two dimension space. And this example showed that if we want to reduce the number of principal component from two to one, we have a better choice. We can choose the first one. If you choose this, um, the second dimension, the variance of data that present in the second dimension is smaller than the first one. So it's not a good choice compared with the first one. This can apply to our idea that we want to lower the number of principal component of the feature if we need to lower our dimension. So let me show you how the dimensionality reduction apply to our input data. First, we will reshape or vectorize our input image to be a column, and we can and concatenate them to a, in a big single matrix. And that is our input image. 
And then we apply the principal component analysis to extract the feature matrix W. You can see on the middle of the, um, the graph. And we extract that from the input matrix X, which is our original and the big data set. The good news is that we can select the number of features we want when we extract our feature matrix. Once you got the feature matrix, you can simply multiply the feature matrix to the input matrix to obtain the weighted matrix, which will be transformed to make our data. And as you can see from the result of weight matrix, it actually have the same real number as feature matrix due to the property of matrix multiplication. By doing that, you can control how many features you want to keep for your weighted matrix. So with this in mind, we propose our idea of combining the linear and nonlinear classifier for accelerate in the training and testing. So the idea is that instead of using the original data or reduced input image, we use the weighted image as training testing data set. That will reduce the data size and still keep the most essential information from the original data set. PCA, for example, will extract the feature matrix from the entire training image. And the, the number of feature M in the figure can be controlled by the user. As you, as you can imagine, you, you, you want to find the best number of features you select. And you want to choose a square number in the application, so keep the same ratio as the original data. Simply multiplying the feature matrix to the original input uh, matrix does not take a long time. And it will produce a very extremely reduced size of the weighted um, matrix. And uh, that's, um, that's also favorable since the PCA will provide a decorated feature. And uh, in turn, that input data will be easier for the understanding for the, our module. So this figure show how extremely the input um, data size can be reduced using linear classifier PCA. And here is our overall framework and pipeline. It is a combination of linear classifier, such as principal component analysis, or non-negative matrix factorization, and uh, the non-linear classifier, which can be either artificial neural network or convolutional neural network. So I will show you two different applications of our uh, project and the corresponding experiment results. So. The first application was trained by weight combined with artificial neural network. First, we produce the weighted input data and feed that to the artificial neural network. As you can see, the original 32 by 32 uh, image was reduced to 10 by 10, which only consisting 100 pixels. The original 32 by 32 image consider 1024 pixels. So, Thanks to the significant reduced input data size, the number of nodes we need in artificial neural network also decreased significantly. Therefore, we only need a small size of artificial neural network to achieve the same result compared with our original data. And because of using small number of nodes than before, the backpropagation process also took far less time. So here's our result for our first application. So compare with the original artificial neural network, uh, like the original artificial neural network take uh, like 78 seconds for 500 iteration. And the accuracy is about 97%. If you train by weight, our artificial neural network using the principal component analysis, we have a moderate accuracy loss, resulting in an accuracy of 96.6, which is still acceptable given that we have um, increased the speed of the training 2.8 times faster. So here is our second application. It is trained by way combined with convolutional neural network. The, so here is the result for the trained by way combined with convolutional neural network. Com compared with the original um, CNN, when we trained by weight, our convolutional neural network benefit from significantly reduced time for convergence. As you can see, the original 32 by 32 took about 900 seconds, about like 16 minutes, but 100 iteration. 
using train by weight of 108 uh, feature, convolutional neural network only took about two minutes to achieve the similar result with only a little over 1% accuracy loss. And this was 18 times faster speed for training and testing of our convolutional neural network, which is a very significant result. As you can see from the actual input data, we can see the input image size was reduced significantly, and it is smaller than the original size. Now, I would like to open a discussion about our research and to propose our future plan for this project. So we believe machine learning or artificial intelligence must be human's assistant and the human must be the decision maker. In addition, we believe expert with the system of machine learning or artificial intelligence may result in better accuracy. Uh, here is a very good model. In the paper, Big Data and the Target Machine Learning in Action to Assist the Medical Decision in ICU, to also provide idea of machine learning to help the medical doctor to provide a personalized treatment for the patient. As we all know, machine learning can generate errors and human can also make mistake or wrong decision. If medical doctor's knowledge and intelligence are supported by machine learning, you actually provide the accuracy even better because machine learning can give you the result from the equipment while doc medical doctor also learn from years of experience. This combination of medical doctor and machine learning is kind of close loop treatment and can be a win-win strategy. In this framework, interpretability from a machine learning algorithm is essential to assist the medical doctor because you need to provide the um, interpretable data and result to the doctor. So one drawback we can see from our result is the interpretability issue. The traditional convolutional neural network or classical principle component analysis can provide interpretability from its first layer. As you can see from the figure, you can still see the face feature such as nose, lips or eyes. However, if we train by weight our convolutional neural network, we actually it is hard to interpret that even after the first convolution. Although the weighted matrix still carry the most important statistical information, it is hard to visualize or interpret from our human perspective. So more specifically, you can see the CBCL image dataset for both face image and the non face image. However, after we do the PCA and got a reduced size of 20 by 20 image, it becomes harder to visualize that. And it is even harder to distinguish between the face image or non-face image. And uh, it is the same for the reduced 10 by 10 image, image. Therefore, we are trying to explore a possible way for visualizing or interpreting the weighted data. Besides the, that, our future work is exploring the, um, the subsampling technique. So we, we want to add a subsampling um, stage before the PCA stage, so we can reduce the size significantly, even, um, even more. So at the same time, we can avoid overfitting problem because for most of higher resolution image, such as 4K image, the pixel nearby or uh, near each other can actually present the same feature. So by doing the subsampling, we believe we can reduce the size by half and still produce very accurate result. Also, we are collaborating with 1215 molecule diagnosis for the rapid saliva based COVID-19 test, which can complete the testing and provide results within 20 minutes. Let me first introduce how the overall process works. First, the test device have a channel consisting of a carbon nanotube and a nanographic. Then the engineered primer, which is a duplication of COVID-19 virus, single strain DNA, will be dropped to the channel. And the droplet will make the channel wet and help the primer to make a bond with the carbon nanotube. And that create a bio nano sensor. As you can see on the second stage, the human saliva sample is introduced to the system. If COVID-19 virus exists in the saliva sample, it will start replicating itself 
by generating single string DNA or RNA, and it will hybridize with the pre-engineered primer. In the third stage, why are the DNA hybridization happen? The total impedance will change and show the transient voltage change. Finally, the, in the fourth stage, the time dependent voltage signal will be measured through the machine learning algorithm and the decision will be made by the human assisted by the machine learning algorithm. So in this collaboration, our goal is to provide a module that can better understand the DNA hybridization in carbon material and to provide high accuracy using machine learning algorithm. As you can see from the left chart or left graph, it is actually a SEM image and the strain are carbon nanotube tangled together. And the rock-like material are actually the nanographic. As you can see, we will create a random geometry and we want to apply the percolation theory to generate a recessive network module. You can see the animation. And I am responsible for generating accurate pattern recognition result and to distinguish the positive and negative case. And I'm currently using a hidden marker module for the time dependent pattern recognition. And Due to the high demand and to provide the mobility, the test devices control the Arduino Uno. And this microcontroller will collect the voltage signal and send it to the main server. As we want to take into account large amount of data, we plan to uh, apply our train by weight approach to improve the speed and data size reduction. We are currently exploring one of these development kits as potential development kit. So, to conclude, we provide a train by weight and algorithmic approach of uh, accelerated machine learning by combination of linear and nonlinear classifier. This simple idea accelerates the training time of system machine learning and deep learning application by up to 18 times. And last but not least, I would like to express my thanks to the RSERF program, which generously support me to initialize our project and the research project continues as independent study during the academic year. And I want to thank our department and the Rose Holman Institute of Technology for offering this environment. I'm also thank 1215 molecule diagnosis for the cooperative research opportunity. So finally, thank you for everyone for listening to my presentation. Now I would like to open the floor and the virtual space for any questions. Thank you, Lynn, and really great presentation. And this is an exciting technique to try to reduce training time and um, potentially network size, maybe. Uh, I got some questions of my own, but um, we have a bunch of questions from the audience. So our first question here is, how much time do you need to perform PCA for the entire data set? And when you share the speed improvement in the slides, did you account for the time needed to perform PCA on each sample as well? Um, the answer is we exclude the time for the training of PCA. Instead, we only um, calculate the time we need for the training. Um, actually, the time we, um, the PCA processing is actually, um, we can, it's negligible, I can say, because it just basically um, a several matrix multiplication. All right, thank you. Okay, and then um, regarding the stats that you showed for performance, were those averaged across multiple training sessions? Um, could you say the question again? Um, were the stats that were in the um, slide, the time it took to run training, was that averaged across multiple training sessions or um, just a single session? Um, it's the average across multiple sessions. I will, I, I'm doing the train test uh, uh, um, um, data, uh, data set split, and I run the average four to, uh, five times and I take the average time. Awesome, thank you. Um, oh, this is a really interesting question um, that I was curious about too. How sensitive is your method to adversarial examples? Um, and I'd also add to that um, out of distribution inputs
I'm not quite sure. Uh, sorry about that, though. Oh, yeah. If Lynn, if Michael was speaking, um, if Lynn can turn off his mic and vice versa. Oh, that's a so, good solution. So can you clarify a little bit about the adversarial um, example? So the question was just generally how sensitive is your method to adversarial examples? But I guess I would sort of um, expand on that by saying like, how, how difficult do you think it, do you think this method could make it easier to construct an adversarial example that, for example, made the network um, classify in a certain way based on some knowledge of the, the possible inputs? That I cannot um, answer to that yet because we haven't tried yet. And um, it's kind of, yeah, in, at this moment, we don't have a good judgment about that sensitivity yet. Uh, we are happy to explore more and hopefully we can come up with that um, uh, result soon. Yeah, and I, I kind of added to that question asking a bit about out of distribution. Um, so if, if a, um, sample that is not contained within the original um, training data distribution is run through the process. Um, have you observed any any impacts on that? And, and kind of is is how does that affect performance? Sorry, can you say? I'm really sorry. Can you say that again? Okay. Oh no problem. Um, so if a if a sample's run through the 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 process of PCA and then inference um, that is out of the original training distribution. Does this have a kind of more profound impact than it would otherwise without the PCA um, on the you know ability of, of the, the network to come up with sane outputs? And is there a good way to test for that type of out of distribution? Mm. I'm, yeah, I'm not quite sure what, what's the best way to test that. Our, um, our hope is because PCA is actually extracting the uh, features that are uh, having the most vari varying um, uh, characteristics. So that can actually uh, focus a little bit more on the, um, the factors that matters most. So probably to answer to your question, we, we hope so, but we have to actually explore a little more. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Um, so another question, do you think this method can be extended to other applications like object detection, segmentation, et cetera? That's, again, that's our future goal. Um, currently we wanted to uh, explore image processing or uh, image recognition as an as an application. So we have a good sense of how well it works. Uh, the good thing is um, it's a linear classifier, which means that it's just a multiplication of matrices, and we don't actually observe too long um, uh, time consumption in terms of extracting the feature and getting the weighted matrix. It's it didn't, it never took more than um, 10 seconds at most. So it's pretty ignorable even with the big size. Um, so yes, we are hoping to actually explore more and hopefully we can uh, improve the interpret interpretability so we can actually um, have more inference to provide to experts uh, because we still believe that Machine learning as a tool, not the um, not the uh, hero of everything. Okay, fantastic. Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, could it be possible? Do you think um, that you could actually just embed one more hidden layer next to the input layer as the first hidden layer, um, and then use that to project the image data to a lower dimension? And could that potentially be? cheaper than doing um, PCA? That's, that was an interesting question too. I, I really like that question. Um, we, we, have to, uh, ex we have to do some experiment. Um, there was a paper uh, that was using PCA for subsampling. 
Uh, but our understanding is we didn't have enough, um, maybe we, we kind of missed the information, but as far as we uh, know, we didn't see any um, comment about the acceleration of training or testing. Uh, but there are definitely um, works that has that have been done uh, using subsampling or having another layer to actually do similar uh, process. So that might be an interesting experiment we can perform too. Awesome. It sounds like this is a, a fruitful area for exploration. Um, mm -hmm. So have you, have you, yeah, there's a similar question. Have you compared the results of PCA-based CNN classification with an equivalent size reduction only using downsampling into a CNN? That, that was actually what uh, Lynn is uh, thinking of. So Lynn is proposing very similar idea and hopefully we can come up with some uh, similar um, downsampling ideas to hopefully accelerate. So um, we're trying to uh, appro uh, make different approaches to basically reduce the uh, input size or uh, training image size. So yeah, that'll be our next goal. Awesome. Um, so in addition to PCA, um, have, you, have you tried any other dimension reduction um, techniques such as projection pursuit? Um, Good question. Yeah, so uh, we didn't include it, but definitely ICA has, its, has another advantage of making independency, uh, achieving independency. So ICA and non-negative uh, matrix factorization, NMF, those are also valid choices. We just didn't pursue because it's a low hanging fruit. So we can definitely explore more. I believe they will uh, give us similar result, but NMF, for example, it's a heuristic approach. So uh, we also observe in the COVID-19 test device uh, recognition that if you have a bigger size sample, uh, you have to actually iterate longer than usual. So uh, in that sense, NMF was not in our, um, our, uh, our, our target yet. Um, definitely ICA, we are trying to um, move forward to see the effect. Excellent. Um, and have you, have you determined how this method performs on other data sets such as CIFAR 100, COCO, et cetera? We, we haven't. <laughs> so CBCL was the base, uh, was our uh, primary choice because we have more uh, understanding about our face rather than, um, definitely we can do handwritten uh, data as, uh, as well. Uh, we just uh, picked an interesting data set. Yeah. But, uh, I tried the, the CIFAR 10 and it actually took uh, more time than the CBCL data set because it, it, the, it is significantly larger. It's like uh, um, 10 class. So that's significantly larger than the current uh, one. So it took uh, more time to training. I didn't post the data here, but we did try the CIFAR 10. And um, a qu question from me, um, and if anyone else in the audience has more questions, please feel free to add them. Um, but my question would be, um, how much potential do you think there is for finding new network architectures um, that are specifically optimized for use with these inputs that have been through PCA? Um, I think with the, the dimension uh, reduction, um, I think we can be applied to more area just than the image recognition. Yeah, just to add a little bit more, um, just to avoid the echo, um, what, what we think the contribution here is, it's a very simple adjustment by combining linear and nonlinear classifier. And uh, we see a big potential that this can be easily applied. So it's a simple architecture that you just combine linear and nonlinear classifiers together, and we achieve faster um, uh, speed in training and testing as well. So uh, we see big potential that this can be applied to any different model uh, if possible. So that'll be our next step that we 
improve the architecture, the current architecture, as well as exploring more. So uh, we are currently, currently Lynn is working uh, on this project as independent study, but we are also trying to, because uh, Rose Holman Institute of Technology is focused on undergraduate education primarily. So we are planning to recruit students for senior design and other independent studies. Excellent. Um, all right, so another question from the audience. Um, how was the 10 to the two size selected? Can you use the statistical info provided by PCA to also choose the reduced dimension size? Yeah, actually, uh, we are choosing the component. The 10, the 10 by 10 basically means you are choosing 100 principal components and you reshape that back to a 10 by 10 image. So that's how the 10 by 10 is choosed. And if you, if you select uh, um, more principal, um, principal components, you can actually make it bigger, like 16 by 16. And you only need to choose 16 by 16 principal component. And we are choosing the, the most important um, um, principal component because we can um, see how many variants the data are present or project into different uh, components. We are choosing from the top to uh, bottom the most a few important one. So to add, add based on what Lin said, um, we chose the squared numbers to make sure we can um, uh, disassemble it. And according and based on the PCA number, uh, we were able to also reduce the size of the uh, nonlinear classifier. So having a smaller data set actually also reduced the model, the neural network model. Uh, that was the biggest advantage we observed. Uh, coming back to the question, 10 by 10 was the number we, um, uh, we uh, dig down to, but what I'm seeing is based on PCA, the nature of PCA, if you go down to let's say two by two, so four pixels, it'll actually have truncation error or actually ignoring some of the uh, features that still matters. matters. So um, they will be, it'll, it'll be like a graph that decays the, the training uh, time and then it'll actually go up at certain point, probably six by six or five by five. That's my guess, okay, yeah. All right, so, um... We have another audience question. Does this method also include the possibility of reducing the number of images and not just the dimensionality? Um, so far the PCA, we select the feature, but we only reduce the dimensionality instead of reducing the image size, the number of images. Do you think there's potential there to be able to sort of leave out some of the training samples as a result of, of kind of reducing mm -hmm. the diversity? Um, it's possible, but we are not sure how the, the selecting algorithm work, like which, which sample is not um, that useful than the others. So it's kind of hard to just get rid of some of the, the input um, data. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting question. Um, so I have a question. So thinking about this from a tiny ML perspective, um, what is approximately the size of the state and the code that is required to um, perform the, the same PCA process on incoming new samples? If this was to be deployed to a microcontroller, for example. Um, like I, I believe there's the kind of part of the future work, but if we're using the MATLAB, there will be less than uh, 50, 100 lines of code, I believe. But I'm not sure how that will like um, apply to the other language like C++, which is commonly used in the microprocess uh, microcontroller. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't a we couldn't actually answer to this question yes yet because we that's also part of our uh, future project. Uh, this class actually the audience are from uh, from the, our elective class called embedded machine learning. So we, we are actually training students to actually uh, 
implement machine learning and embedded systems. So we're trying to see how much advantage power consumption wise and uh, timing wise with the limited uh, uh, hardware size. So this, so our, our presentation today is pretty much the preliminary result of uh, three or four different projects we will pursue in the next year. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing the, the results of those in a future session. All right, so I think um, we're, we're all good for questions now. So thank you so much, Lynn and Michael. Um, really appreciate your time and uh, really fascinating presentation. So I'm going to walk through some, some follow-up slides. So hopefully my um, screen's working. There we go. So hopefully you took the poll um, that popped up. And if you'd like to talk more on the topic, head over to the forums and um, post, post your thoughts and questions. I'd like to thank again our TinyML Talk sponsors. So we have our strategic partners, Arm and Qualcomm. And then we also have our sponsors, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, which is where I work, Maxim Integrated, Kickshow, Reality AI, and Syncense. And if you're interested in sponsoring, please contact Olga at tinyml.org. Um, so one of our sponsors is Arm, who provide the software and hardware foundation for TinyML. We also have Qualcomm, who are advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. DeepLight use AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Edge Impulse is a tiny ML platform for all developers to make it super easy to get started training models and deploying them to devices. Maxim integrated enable edge intelligence, including the using their new Max 78000, which implements AI inference at low energy levels, enabling complex audio and video inferencing to run on small batteries. Kixo Auto ML is an automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI allows you to add advanced sensing to your product with Edge AI and TinyML. Synsense builds sensing and inference hardware for ultra low power embedded mobile and edge devices. They design systems for real time, always on smart sensing for audio, vision, IMUs, biosignals, and more. So our next talk is by Chris Norowski. He's the CTO of SensiML. And he's been going to be talking about building an edge optimized tiny ML application for the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense. That's a cool board. Um, and that's on Tuesday, May 11th. So if you have any um, topic that you'd like to talk with our community about, please contact talks at tinyml.org if you're interested. Thank you so much to everybody for attending. And thank you so much to our presenters, Lynn and Michael. Look forward to seeing you next time.